Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Lovely manners, Matthew. Um, okay, so um, today we are going to be looking at a few chapters from the book of Genesis sort of in the sort of broad context of ancient Near Eastern literature and mythology, right? So I do want to stress what I mean by mythology when I'm talking today, right? Um, I am not using the term myth in the colloquial sense that we tend to use, like, you know, oh, that's just a myth, right? Like, that's something that is untrue, right? When I'm talking about mythology, what I'm talking about is a set of stories, right, a set of narratives that are attached to a particular belief system, you know, that provides a sort of cultural and religious or spiritual glue, right? So once again, you know, like I said at the end of last class, I'm not trying to assault anyone's belief systems here, right? I'm not going after anyone's deeply held personal religious convictions. What we are doing, though, is just sort of looking at this as a text, right? And I think one of the best places to start when we're looking at this as a text is to think about the history of the text as it's been received. Right, as it's been read um, historically. Now, when we talk about tradition here, right, does anybody know who traditionally is supposed to have written the first five books of the Bible? Right, what uh, Christians call the Pentateuch and what Jews call the Torah. I thought there were different authors. We'll get to that. Traditionally, who's supposed to have written it? Does anybody know? Pardon? Hey, it's Peter supposed to have written chunks of it, but I don't remember. Which okay, we're, we're talking. Okay, you're talking about the the New that's Testament. The New Testament. That's yeah, this this yeah, the stuff Peter the stuff that's in Greek. Kind of like King James version. No, I'm I'm talking about just the first five books, right? Like the old, like the Hebrew yeah. Bible. Yeah. What are well? They're usually referred to the books of the Genesis. books of Moses. Yes. But so, traditionally, authorship was ascribed to Moses, right? Now, this actually is a tradition that arises a little bit later than one might think. Um, it seems to pop up at some point after the Roman occupation of Israel. Earlier... How many books were supposed to be, like, this first five? The, just the, yep, the first five, right? Okay. So, Genesis... Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy were supposed to have been the work of Moses. And this actually seems to have been a myth constructed by um, a people who suddenly found themselves displaced and their temple destroyed. So they attributed their religious scriptures to this sort of ancient culture hero. Are you talking about like when they destroyed the ark? No, I'm talking about when the Romans... Uh, like the Ark... Well, I'm, I'm not talking about the Ark like in the Flood. I'm talking about the Ark... Um, the Ark of the Covenant. I, I, I know, I know yeah. what you mean. Yeah, no, and I'm still not talking about the, that, okay. that Ark. I'm talking about um, the Second Temple. Oh, this, oh, okay, the Second yes, Temple. Yes, yes. So I'm talking about when the Romans came in to Israel-Palestine... And you know, destroyed and despoiled most, most, many of the religious sites there, right? So after that period, that's when people start talking about Moses as the author of the first five books. It seems that prior to that, people acknowledged that these books were in fact woven together from a variety of sources. So we'll get to that in a moment. But Throughout the Middle Ages, you know, the Renaissance, the Age of Enlightenment, there are various people who are looking at these texts and thinking that the whole mosaic authorship thing doesn't quite add up for various reasons. One, while Moses is the central figure through most of it, he's described mostly through third-person accounts, which is a kind of weird thing for the writer of a text to do. There are also statements attributed to Moses that he probably wouldn't have made 
For example, it is unlikely that Moses would have called himself the humblest man in the world. <laughs> that would right? be yes, except that would, that would negate the sentiment you are trying to express. There is also, at the end of the book of Numbers, right, the report of Moses' death. I mean, could they be talking about written by Moses in the same sense that we talk about the New Testament? Um, are the Bible as a whole being written by God? Like, the concept that it's inspired by them, and there's like a divinity to it that... That, that may have been the original impetus for the association, but it took on a literal dimension, particularly in the Middle Ages, for both uh, Jewish authorities and Christian authorities. So, further on. It's full of anachronistic place names. Right, places called by names that they did not acquire until well after the time of Moses. There's also material included that would have occurred after Moses died. And finally, and perhaps most telling, we have contradictory accounts of the same events. What are, some, what are sometimes called doublets? by academic biblical scholars. So these doublets are often sort of places where the seams show, right? These are places where you can see multiple prior accounts being woven together into a single continuous narrative, right? These are really sort of places where the continuous narrative breaks up in a way. Uh, examples of this would be The creation story, the flood story, and the account or accounts of Abraham's covenant. These are all presented to us in multiple and sometimes contradictory versions. And the reasons why, of course, these appear in multiple and contradictory versions is that as most academic biblical scholars now accept, these books were written by more than one person and then pulled together by someone, someone else at a much later date. The date usually given is sort of shortly after um, the Israelites returned from exile in Babylon. That, okay, you know, now we put together our holy book, right? Now that we are restored to our, prop, to our homeland. Yeah, Megan. So, I mean, I'm more, I, I understand the Bible as a whole more than I do, like, the first few books of it. So, mm -hmm. like, when we're talking about, like, when this stuff is canonized, uh -huh. I know that the New Testament wasn't canonized until about 200 years after Jesus' death. When was the Old Testament canonized? Well, and that's one of the, we don't quite know, right? From a Christian perspective, the Old Testament and New Testament were canonized at the same time. Okay. And in fact, there are books that are included in, say, Catholic Bibles that are not included in Protestant Bibles. So the idea of even a fixed biblical canon, right? There isn't one. It has changed over time. Mm -hmm. um, if you look, for example, at the canon of uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. They have the most number of books. In yeah, there. they include a lot of scriptures that neither the Catholic Church nor the Protestant tradition nor even other Orthodox traditions include. Right. So the question of what is and isn't canon um, is kind of a sticky one and also probably not really relevant to what we're talking about today. Yeah, Darlene. Um, this might be a stupid question because I live in the South Florida. Okay, canon. Sorry. Okay, C A N O N. Can of words. 
right? Canon comes from the Greek word kanon, which means measuring stick. And the term is usually applied to those books of the Bible that are considered authoritative by church authorities, right? There are, as we talked a little bit about last time, lots of Christian and Jewish scriptures floating around the ancient world. Some of them we're not really sure where they came from. And some of them express ideas that are not quite consonant with uh, what comes to be regarded as orthodoxy. So, at certain historical points, church authorities have come together and decided these are the official books and these other books are, shall we say, extra, right? Or not even recognized. Yeah, or not recognized at all, right? So canon refers to those books that are recognized, uh, books of the Bible that are recognized as authoritative by religious authorities. And yeah, Jewish canons look a little bit different from Catholic canons, which look a little bit different from Orthodox canons, which look a little bit different from Protestant canons. Right, so depending on which Judeo-Christian tradition you're coming from, you'll be reading a different Bible, basically. But like what time frame here? Like what time frame are we looking at for this these first five books? These first five books? Um, well, probably put together sometime um, at the, sometime in the fifth century BCE is what we're looking at. This is probably about when these first five books were assembled, at least according to one hypothesis, right? There are multiple hypotheses about biblical authorship. The one that kind of all others are built on is the hypothesis of a guy by the name of Julius Wellhausen. And this marker sucks. Let's see if this is any better. And in 1878, Wellhausen, who was a scholar of Ancient, um, ancient Near Eastern languages and um, theology at various universities in Germany. In 1878, he published a book in which he came up with what he called the Documentary Hypothesis. And Wellhausen, through his examination of the original Hebrew texts, such as we could know them, came up with four different narrative strands. Right, he detected four, at least four separate authors in the first five books of the Bible. And they're usually referred to by letter. J, E, D and P. J stands for Yahwist. The Yahwist strand is dated by scholars to anywhere between the 10th and the 7th centuries BCE. So this is the one that they're really kind of most unsure about how to date. The second, E, stands for Eloist. And the Eloist strand probably dates from the 8th century BCE. So there is some debate among scholars between whether the J strand or the E strand is older. But these two represent kind of the oldest mythological substratum of those first five books. D stands for Deuteronomist. The Deuteronomist contributes the smallest amount of material, basically only the book of Deuteronomy. That's the only part of the first five books that is attributed to this writer. And 
This was probably sometime in the 6th century BCE. And the largest source of material is P or priestly writer. And the priestly writer is probably writing sometime in the 5th century. Wellhausen and some other early scholars believed that the priestly writer was also the one that pulled all of the others together. Right? Because the priestly strain contains the most material and seemed to be the latest. It would seem to make sense to a scholar like Wellhausen, right, that he was sort of using the other three sources to fill in gaps in the narrative, right? As sort of connective tissue, connective glue. Later theorists have um, detected a sort of fifth voice that they call R or the redactor. Right, these are people who don't think that the priestly author pulled everything together. Basically, they think that this fifth figure assembled these four earlier strands into a continuous narrative. And you can sort of see signs of that. Now, I'm sure there is one burning question on most of your minds concerning these four narrative strands, right? And go ahead and ask. Can you tell the difference? Yeah, that's the question. How do you tell the difference? Some of it has to do with um, sort of different concerns, right? But on the most basic level, they use different names for God. The Yahwist is called the Yahwist because he tends to use Yahweh. Yeah, Y H W H, the so called tetragrammaton, right? That's the As the name of God. Right. Yeah. So, but the weird thing about that, right, is that after a certain period in history, this, these syllables are considered unutterable by Jews, right? You're not supposed to speak or write them. So that's one of the reasons why they tend to think that this particular strand is very, very early, because they're still using these sacred syllables as a name for God. What made them sacred all of a sudden? That I couldn't tell you. I can't, that, that's, that's a question I don't know the answer to. My understanding is that it was always sacred, but the difference is like when, we, when we're looking at the Jewish tradition, um, they were being persecuted, basically. And that, like a lot of times, when they speak of Yahweh, it kind of distinguishes them from the external gods mm -hmm. and God of the time. Sure. So, I mean, the whole concept of it's unspeakable was kind of like, my understanding was mm -hmm. put in later. Well, th th this, th this is actually something that develops fairly, fairly early in tradition, though, um, and uh, probably has more... Um, I'm not sure why it develops, to be perfectly frank. Um, I don't, but I just know that the unutterableness of the, of the name becomes a historical fact at some point. Now, E, the Eloist, is so called because the name for God he tends to use is Elohim. Elohim is a generic Western Semitic term for any god. Right? So Elohim means small g, O D. Yeah, well. How would you spell that? Oh, E L O H I M. Now, <clears throat> it is also true that what Elohim actually sort of literally means in Western Semitic is the children of El. And El was a uh, sky god of the Canaanites, a sort of father deity who shares a lot of traits in common both with, say, like the Greek Zeus, and also with the, is the Hebrew Israelite Yahweh. The Deuteronomist is so named because he only wrote that one book, Deuteronomy. Some scholars think that the guy who wrote Deuteronomy is the same guy who wrote the book of Jeremiah and also some of those books of history that are in the Old Testament. And the priestly strand tends to use the name Adonai. 
for God, which means Lord. Why don't we just translate them all one? Pardon? Like, I mean, when you look at a Bible, and, you, yeah. and there's like a million different versions, uh -huh. a lot of the Bible specifically point this out, and I don't see a point. I mean, if it's all supposed to be, it's just a time period, there's no point in it. Why can't you just say God for all of them? But they literally like star it and then put under it. Well, be, because when when you're when you're translating, typically you want to translate as accurately as you can, and you know, um, it's also just sort of good writerly practice to not reuse the same word over and over again. But Darlene, what, what were you going to say? So the Deuteronomous did uh -huh. he use like call God God? Um, or does it not say? I don't actually know okay. what name the Deuteronomist uses. Uh, for God. The way I know you distinguish the Deuteronomist from the others is that he's only present in that one book of the first five. And the style is very, he uses is very similar to, and his sort of concerns are very similar to the guy who wrote the book of Jeremiah. So these also, ref they also tend to reflect different concerns that seem to have to do with sort of different stages in the development of a religion. The oldest strains, the Yahwist and the Eloist, reflect a time when the Israelite religion was primarily still a fertility religion. Right, monotheistic but otherwise much like other ancient Near Eastern religions, right? The primary concern being that the land and the people remain fruitful. Now, the, one, of the, one other way you can distinguish the Yahwist from the Eloist, right, is that the Yahwist tends to present God as anthropomorphic. Does anybody know? Does everybody know what anthropomorphic means? No. no. Okay. Yeah. Well. Is it like looking out for the people? No. Actually, um, anytime you see the word morph or the the syllable morph in a uh, Greek derived word, it means shape, right? It's giving things human shape. Exactly. Yeah, it's a human shaped god, right? So the Yahwist tends to depict a very human sort of god. Are you saying both the first two, the, the Yahwist and the Just Yahwist? the Yahwist. Okay. Just the Yahwist. The Yahwist tends to give us a very kind of human-shaped God who walks in the garden, who talks to people, who directly addresses people. The Eloist, on the other hand, presents a God who tends to speak primarily through messengers, dreams, or angels. So, for example, much of the... How many of you are familiar with the story of Joseph and his brothers? Okay, right. So a lot of the story of Joseph, Joseph and his brothers, as we have it, we think comes from the Eloist strain, right? Because it's mostly God talking to people through visions, through dreams. The Yahwist doesn't seem to present God in this way. Didn't the very first mention of God in the Bible, on the first page, didn't that use a different word than all three of those, though? I don't, do you read Hebrew? Um, it, no, I just I read the little part at the bottom where it actually mm -hmm. mentioned it. Right. Because the first, the very first word in the first mention of God on the very first page of the Bible mm -hmm. mentions how the world or earth was created by the gods, plural, and they used a plural version of the old Jewish. Mm -hmm. So why would he suddenly switch up? If well, it's the same author. <clears throat> It's, well, that's the thing, is it's not. This is one thing to note here, is that the first account of creation in Genesis, we think is actually historically later than the second account, for reasons I'll get to in a moment. Right, but one thing that we have to note as we're looking at these, these don't always appear in the historical order in which they were created, right? We have these doublets, right? These similar but often contradictory versions of the same story usually kind of smushed together in various ways. Yeah, Darlene. So are all the different authors from different religions? No. 
No, but we're, we're looking at different phases in the development of okay. a single religion. Okay. Right? It's all the same religion. It's all that same monotheistic Israelite religion. But there's a very sort of slow historical process of development, the same sort that most religions go through over time. And one of the reasons why we date the Yahwist and the Yellowist is so early is that their concerns are much more similar to other ancient Near Eastern religions. What's the second word? Dreams or? Angels. Oh. Messengers of various sorts. So yeah, when, when you have two guys showing up, for example, at somebody's tent to tell them something that God wants them to know, that's usually something that comes from the Yellowist. The Deuteronomist. Right, who's primarily concerned with rules of various sorts and how you behave towards other people tends to represent a spiritual or ethical phase in the development of the religion. Pardon? Sounds like a fun guy. Oh, probably. <laughs> Certainly probably a lot less fun than the fertility guys. <clears throat> but Deuteronomy is, is where we get one of our two versions of the Ten Commandments, right? There's one in Exodus, there's one in Deuteronomy, and they're not the same. There's like 500 and something commandments, though. Well, if you're talking about, yeah, like all those rules in Leviticus, yeah, those are also, but if we're talking about the Ten Commandments, there are basically, they're, they're, the Ten Commandments are spelled out in two places, in the book of Exodus and in the book of Deuteronomy. But my, under, but my understanding of the Jewish is that, that um, God actually gave them 500 something commandments but only put 10 on the tablets right well tablets are small <laughs> right how are you gonna you know how are you gonna carry around 500 commandments now most look here, here's the and this is one of the reasons why um a lot of contemporary jews don't follow every single rule that you find in the book of leviticus um one uh, it would make modern life extremely difficult and impractical, right? Mm -hmm. um, any shellfish? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my my wife keeps kosher. Um, she doesn't eat she doesn't eat shellfish. She doesn't eat pork. Um, seriously? Yeah, seriously. Lots of people. Lots of people do. I don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Muslims also don't eat pork. I mean, I know that that's true, but like mm -hmm. I've met so many Jews who just like don't follow basically any of the food rules except for like mm -hmm. special occasions. Right. It's well, kind of odd. But also, sort of, you know, generalizing from anecdote, right? Right, and that's true. I do do that, but like everybody does. But okay, let, let's let's not wander too far afield here, though, right? Let's just sort of um, try and finish this little bit here. Okay, so the Deuteronomist represents a spiritual ethical phase of the development of the religion. The priestly phase, on the other hand, represents a sort of ritual hierarchical, an organized religion fully developed. Right? Not just with rules about how you're supposed to treat other people and behave with other people, but rules about um, what you're supposed to eat, washing your hands, um, you know, sort of cleanliness rituals. Um, apparently, you are not supposed to wear blended fabrics. Um, when your wife is menstruating, you're supposed to make her live in the tent out in the yard. Right? That's where all of this part comes in. Right? Yeah, Darlene. How is that different from the, the D1 rules? Um, one, uh, there are a lot more of them. <laughs> and two, the emphasis is often more on obedience to authority. Okay. For Deuteronomy? No, for, for the, the priestly, priestly. For the priestly writer, yes. So, Deuteronomy. is there any actual evidence of the redactor, or is that just a possibility to keep around? Um, as far as I know, there is evidence. I mean, like, I'm... Because... Mm -hmm. I'm only as deep into this stuff as I need to be to teach a 2,000 level world the literature class. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that a fifth person came, came mm -hmm. along and combined these other four guys' thought process. Yeah. Why would the fifth guy leave in all the contradictory bullshit? Well, I think Especially that's right after each other. From, like, from what hmm. I, from what I understand, that's actually one of the uh, pieces of evidence that people use to argue for a redactor is that if one of these authors was weaving everything together, they would have made much, they would have made a much stronger effort at continuity. Um, like if we look for example, you know, the, 
the Epic of Gilgamesh, we know, is also a composite text that's made up of a variety of different traditions that forms a continuous narrative without these same contradictions, by and large. And we can actually attribute that to a single historical author who went and did all of that. Um, the reason why they think, and they, at least like there's, um, I'm gonna refer you to my source for a lot of this. There's a pretty good book by a guy named Richard Elliott Friedman. It's called Who Wrote the Bible? And it's on the bibliography that I posted in Georgia View. Um, I know that you can get it through our libraries because I was forced to pay for a new <coughs> copy when the people at Darton said I hadn't returned it when I did. Mm -hmm. Richard Elliott Friedman. So how do you tell the redactor? Does he have a specific name for God? Does he have anything separate? No, the, the redactor is theorized, again, mostly, again, because of the way it's put together, right? That what Friedman argues is that because all four of these strands uh, had probably already by that time but attained some level of, sacred, um, of sacredness to maybe various factions within the population, it was either politically or spiritually dangerous um, to not work in all four. So he's essentially just the editor? Yeah, essentially just an editor. Yeah, Emily. Oh, I thought you had a hand up, I'm sorry. Okay, so, can we get to actually talking about the text now? <laughs> Have I cleared up most of any confusion here? Okay, so let's look at how this works in practice by looking at the two accounts of creation, right? Now one of the things I asked you in the guide questions uh, last time was how these two accounts differ from each other. Were you able to see differences in the account of creation that we get in Genesis 1 and the account that we get in Genesis 2? No. I emailed you about it. Mm -hmm. I, and you honestly did not find any difference. Well, I can see where it could look like a separate story, but to me, the second mm -hmm. one is just like a detailed version of one of the days. So it's like just like it's the same story to me. But things happen in a different order. Yeah. And the, the actions of God and the presence of God in the second story are really quite different from the presence of God in the first story, right? What sort of God do we, what, how does God behave in the first chapter there? He acts very much like the creation or any other ancient myth. He just mm -hmm. makes the things and puts things here. Mm -hmm. And if you be disobedient with order, he will punish you and curse you. Yeah, well, that, that comes a little later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry, somebody said something about... He speaks it into existence. Yeah, he just speaks things into existence, right? We don't really see a human-like God crafting and molding things, right? We see a God who speaks and things happen. Now, is he actually at least initially, speaking things into existence. Is there absolutely nothing there when he starts? Uh, well, like when he first started off, it was like the earth was kind of dark, but he said mm -hmm. there light, so then light came upon the earth, and I guess after that, he just started creating things on earth. To make mm -hmm. Well, but is he creating these things out of nothing, out of no material? Let's uh, sort of dig into this a little bit here, page 158, right? I mean, it doesn't seem so, because the, the very first thing is saying when God began to create the heaven and earth. It doesn't mm -hmm. say anything about the rest of it. There is chaos. Yeah, and there's right. welter and waste. There's chaos. Sorry. So, so, I mean, like, there's, there's something there. Right. There's water there. There's material to work with, and there's water there. Yes, good. So he, he started like, so he's saying like he started with like a seed and he planted it and it, it sprouted and it, like the earth became like everything else. Like a seed started out like with God, it's like all this stuff, mm -hmm. he started out with nothing. And he put brought into something like with like one little seed. Like well, that, that's closer to what he does in the chapter two story, right? We have more like God actually sort of physically planting a garden in the chapter two story after he creates human, after he creates the first human. Well, is it energy that's there? Like the mm -hmm. turmoil? Yeah, this kind of turmoil, like, when we think about chaos, right, what do we imagine? Now, the Greeks, by chaos, meant a kind of yawning chasm or gap, right? 
So we've, right, we've seen this exact description of what was there before all time, right, when we looked at theogony. But what do we typically mean when we talk about chaos? Like, I, I think of it like you no know, rules of science, like just mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah, it's just this amorphous whatever, right? No rhyme or reason, no rules. Um, everything just is sort of doing whatever the hell it wants. And so we see in a lot of creation myths, right, the first action of the creator God is to impose some kind of order on chaos. Now, it's interesting, you know, Louisa, you mentioned water as well. What kind of monster was Tiamat in the... She was a water dragon. Yeah, she's a water monster. So we have here traces of these older myths in which the creator god, or you know, usually some kind of sky god or storm god, kills a water monster in order to sort of create or defend civilization. So there's not nothing for God to work with at the beginning of this, right? There are raw materials out of which the world is crafted. And the earth was in welter and waste and darkness over the deep and God's breath hovering over the waters. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Now this indicates another sort of pattern here, right? The things that God does. Again, instead of making or crafting, what's he actually doing? He's doing it yeah, dividing and naming, right? He's splitting this chaos up into parts and naming it. Right, and when you name something, when you decide what something is going to be called, you are exercising authority over it, right? You are exercising power over it. So if I just decide um, you know, at random, to give one of you a nickname, like say, I'm gonna call you Squidgy, right? And I just keep calling you that, whether you like it or not, I am exercising some sort of power of like, I don't care what your name actually is, I'm just gonna call you what I want. I'm not going to call you that, by the way. It's just, <laughs> so, you know, no fear. But <clears throat> he's exercising power and authority over this, sort of, this new universe, right? And one thing to note, right, when we get to human beings finally here, right, in this first chapter, are men and women created separately? No. 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 Right? They're spoken into existence at the same time. Right? Man and woman created he them. The other thing to note in chapter one is that human beings are never the subject of a sentence in chapter one. They're always the object of the sentence, right? Man and woman are objects that are acted upon by God's power. They are not themselves independent agents of any sort yet. Can you repeat that? You said that they're not. Yeah. It, they're, they're never the subject of a sentence, right? Which means that in chapter one, Human beings, man and woman, are never active beings, right? They're acted upon. Now, when we look at chapter two, how is chapter two different? First, what do we start with in chapter two? What's the first thing that gets made? What's that? I'm sorry? Okay, oh, well, that's, okay, that's just sort of, hold over from chapter one. Ch okay, so the first paragraph there, the first little bit, is the, sa is the same story as chapter one. It continues slightly to chapter two. Right, the blessing of the seventh day. Pardon? He fashions humans? Humans? Yeah. Uh, the rivers were created, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, what's, what's there even, but what, what does he do even before he plants. makes the rivers? What's the plant? Makes it rain. Makes it rain, yeah. On the day the Lord God made earth and heavens, 
No shrub of the field being yet on the earth, and no plant of the field yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not caused rain to fall on the earth, and there was no human to till the soil, and wetness would, uh, would well from the earth to water all the surface of the soil. Then the Lord God fashioned the human hummus from the soil, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the human became a living creature. So we already detect a couple of differences here, right? One in the behavior of God here, right? We don't have a distant authority figure speaking things into existence. We have a human-like God digging his hands into the soil and molding a human form, then physically breathing into it to give it life, right? So this is something that is much closer to, um, in many ways, other ancient mythologies. Isn't it kind of weird, though, that in the first one, that mm -hmm. God created human in his image, and in the second one, he uses the soil? I mean, isn't that just kind of... Well, think about the different concerns of these different narrative strands, right? The first chapter comes from the priestly strand. Right, organized religion, rules, hierarchy, obedience. Everyone in their place, right? Mm -hmm. Well-ordered universe. The second, if we have an anthropomorphic God, right, a God who looks and behaves like a human being, which strand do you think the second story comes from? Yahweh. Yeah, this is from the Yahwist, exactly. And the Yahwist is not concerned with rules and hierarchy and order, right? What is the Yahwist concerned with? Fertility. Fertility, yes. So it makes absolute total sense that in a fertility religion, human beings would have this kind of deep connection to the earth, right? Made from the soil. Rather than sort of spoken into existence, in the image of their creator, right? Here, you know, we actually have, you know, God getting his hands dirty, digging in and making human beings to, to right? There's, so that there is someone to eventually till the soil, right? And Kido was made the same way, right? Yeah. And Kido is also a sort of a crafted human. And we do see in various ways here analogs too. Um, certain certain strands in, in Gilgamesh um, and you know it might be a good idea to point at that for a minute so I think you know if we look at these two side by side we by and large see the difference here between for example like the priestly strain and the Yahwist strain right on the one hand right the Yahwist emphasizes the importance of human beings in the grand scheme of things particularly men by having you know Adam made before all other things and then Eve made at the end of the process, well after Adam. From his rib. From his rib, yeah. I mean, that kind of like puts you in a position where I mean, you're mm -hmm. kind of subservient to the man. Sure. Um, what I want to look at now um, is a story that really kind of indicates to us some of the larger concerns that we see in the book of Genesis um, and that <clears throat> tells us a little bit about certain features of biblical narrative. Right, so turn to page 161. And can I get a volunteer to read uh, starting at the beginning of chapter 4? What page is on? This is page 161. It's about the human. <clears throat> yep, and the human knew Eve, yep. And the human knew Eve, his woman, and she conceived and bore and bore, bore Cain. Mm -hmm. And bore Cain, and she said, I have I have got me a man with the Lord. And she bore and well as, as his brother Abel. Mm -hmm. Abel became a herder of sheep, while Cain was a tiller of the soil. And it happened in the course of time that Cain brought the fruit, I mean brought, yeah, brought fruit from the, I mean brought from the fruit of the soil. And mm -hmm. it happened in the course of time, oh, yeah. offering the Lord, offering mm -hmm. to the Lord. And Abel uh, too had brought from the choice of Choice first leans of his flock and the mm -hmm. Lord regarded Abel and his offering, and that he did not regard Cain as offering. And Cain was very incensed, and his face fell. Okay, thank you. You can stop there. 
So the two brothers have different occupations, right? The elder brother is a farmer, and of course, Margaret dies. All right, back to the other shitty Margaret. Right, Cain is a farmer, and Abel is a shepherd. Now, we already have some cultural associations, right, in the ancient Near East with shepherds, right? What's shepherd a metaphor for? Yeah, king. Right? The shepherd of the people, bold, accomplished, and mature. So, each brother brings offerings to God, yep, from his own activities. One brother's offering is accepted, the other's is rejected. Does the narrative tell us why? Mm. Nope. No motive is given on the part of God here, right? He just refuses one offering and accepts the other. This is indicative of one of the major features of biblical narrative. There's very little in-depth personal psychology, and rarely are any characters, you know, God or anyone else's, rarely are their motives explained, right? We see them almost entirely through dialogue, and there's a lot more dialogue than there is narration throughout the Hebrew Bible, and yeah, through action. Even when Cain goes out into the field and kills his brother, we only understand his motivation because of the prior dialogue, right? It does not get inside Cain's head in any way. Now, I have a little sort of pet theory that there is, in fact, a motivation here for refusing Cain's sacrifice. But we have to sort of look at what's implied in various passages around this chapter in order to get that. Um, when Eve eats the fruit that's given to her by this, or the, the serpent talks her into, right? And this is another thing um, to briefly note as well. When we talk about the serpent here, um, later Christian readers will interpret the serpent as Satan. Isra the ancient Israelites did not. To them, it's just a snake, right? It's just a serpent to them. There still is no devil. There's no devil in Judaism. So to the, to the writers and readers of this original text, the snake would not have represented the devil. So that's just one thing. At once he has tricked Eve into eating of the fruit, What's the curse that's laid on her and Adam? Uh, they, uh, Eve has horrible pain while they're yeah. a child. And when, she's, yep. when you have your children, it's going to hurt. Yeah. And, and what, he, she is second in how, like, Adam is now over her. Mm -hmm. And Adam has to bear the labor of yep. pr pretty much working and providing. Yeah. And what is he specifically told he has to do to earn his bread? Uh, sweat from his brow. Yep. Thorn and th the curse be the soil for your sake. With pangs you shall eat from it all the days of your life. Thorn and thistle shall it sprout for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread till you return to the soil from, for from where there you were, where you were taken. For dust you are, to dust you shall return. So, what specifically is he cursed to do if he's going to have to earn his like earn his keep with hard labor from the soil? Yeah. Farming is a curse. So Cain works at a cursed occupation, right? The fact that Cain is a farmer is evidence of his parents' curse. Also, when he gives him um, some, one of his babies from his cattle, that's supposed mm -hmm. to be pure and innocent, and so that's one mm -hmm. reason why it was accepted. Right. And right, right. We, we do, right, we associate mm -hmm. 
um, the lamb with innocence, right? And you can, when mm -hmm. you read further into the Bible, it doesn't say it there, but when you read further into the Bible, sure. you associate it mm -hmm. with that. But yeah, my, my point is though that yeah. it doesn't actually Not spell there. it out mm -hmm. here, right? And that in order to get any motive, motive at all from this, you have, to, um, you have to look at the whole thing in context. Mm -hmm. But I mean, now, like, why would this God like just, I mean, Cain is a farmer, and yeah. the farming needs to be done. Like, it, it kind of almost doesn't mm -hmm. make sense that he would refuse an offering just because that's a cursed offering. Okay, well, I'm, I'm also not finished yet. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, especially, I mean, we're still in the Yahweh's. Yeah. And they were, they were all about fertility, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So it makes even less sense for them to hate farmers. Her, well, yeah. her, right, herdsmen are participants in the whole fertility thing as well, right? Not nearly to the extent that farmers are, though. Mm -hmm. But let, let, me, let me just continue along these lines, and we'll see what you think then, okay? Right, so, which occupation requires greater technological advancement? Farming or herding? Farming. Farming by a long shot, right? Herding, right, as long as you have a decent dog, you can sit on a rock and play your Odin flute and you know, dance with the wood nymphs and what have you, and you know, engage in singing contests with other shepherds like you do. Um, and you don't actually have to really work at it very hard, right? Sheep aren't that smart. They're not that curious about the world around them. It's not that hard to keep them from wandering off. Farming, on the other hand, right, requires tools. It requires a certain level of intellectual sophistication. Now, if we look at the line of Cain's descendants, right, we notice something here as well. If we look on page 162. And Cain went out from the Lord's presence and dwelled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Then he became the builder of a city and called the name of his city, the city, like his son's name, Enoch. So Cain builds a city for his son. Right? He's already a farmer. He also builds the first city. And Arad was born to Enoch, and Erad, be Erad begot Mahujael, and Mahujael begot Methusael, and Methusael begot Lamech. And Lamech took him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the first of tent dwellers with livestock. As for Zillah, she bore Tubal Cain, who forged every tool of copper and iron. Right. First forger of tools. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Right. His brother's name was Jubal, the first of all who play on the lyre and pipe. So inventor of musical instruments. Right. First musician. So this looks, on the surface, like a, actually a pretty illustrious line here, right? I mean, they build a city. I think where you're going with this. Okay, where do you think I'm going with this? Um, Cain, so the great sin of humankind is eating from the tree of knowledge. Uh -huh. Cain's line of descendants all progressed further along knowledge, whereas Abel mm -hmm. stayed mostly true to the life that God had originally uh, designed for you. Yeah. Cain starts a line of civilized people, right? City dwellers, large-scale raisers of livestock, blacksmiths, musicians, right? Cain's line of descent shows a fair amount of intellectual and social sophistication. Now, if we look at this in terms of the later Tower of Babel story as well. Right, if we turn to page 167. And all the earth was one language, one set of words. And it happened as they journeyed from the east that they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let us bake bricks and burn them hard. And the bricks served them as stone, and bitumen served them as mortar. And they said, come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. 
that we may make us a name, lest we be scattered over all the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the human creatures had built. And the Lord said, as one people with one language for all, if this is what they have begun to do, now nothing they plot will elude them. Come, let us go down and baffle their language so that they will not understand each other's language. And the Lord scattered them from there all over all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it is called Babel, for there the Lord made the language of all the earth Babel. And from there the Lord scattered them over all the earth. So we see here a fairly consistently negative attitude towards technology and city building, right? A negative attitude towards large-scale social developments and a negative attitude towards making tools and machines. So I think that the farming curse and Cain's sin are reflections of this kind of hostility towards a certain kind of progress. Now, where might this be coming from? Well, one thing, I think we were talking about this the other day, because you said you had been looking over the story with a friend or something, and sort of came to this, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that, like, the Tower of Babel resembles the ziggurat temples that you see in ancient Middle Eastern ruins. Now, <clears throat> the ancestors of the Israelites came from more or less the same place that the Epic of Gilgamesh was written, right? They weren't of the people who dwelled in and built city-states, right? They weren't like the Sumerians or the Babylonians or the Assyrians or these other groups. In fact, those people were often their enemies. They were nomadic herds people. This is where their society originated, right? They started out herding sheep and cattle, while other people around them were building these great big city-states. And they don't really start settling in cities until the foundation of, you know, sort of the original kingdom of Israel and then splits into the kingdoms of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. So what we see, I would argue, is the nomadic pastoralists' distrust of city folk reflected in, in these early stories in the Bible. Yeah, Kayla. Um, I can see um, a part after the curse with the farming. Mm -hmm. um, in the passage after it says, now that the human has become like one of us, Knowing mm -hmm. good and evil, he may reach out and take as well from the tree of life and live forever. And I think God is recognizing, holy crap, the humans are gaining mm -hmm. knowledge and power. Yeah. So we got to do something. And they're especially dangerous when they band together, right? Mm -hmm. They're spe Oh, God, it's both of them who ate from the tree of knowledge? Oh, man, they're all building this city together, right? This is what they can accomplish if they work in a group, right? Nope. No more working in groups. Right, group work bad. You're a nomadic herdsman who has to pray to your God every night to mm -hmm. provide for food and, and yeah. water. And then a bunch of folk over here start building buildings. And, oh, there's a river right here. Yeah. Well, screw our food. We don't uh -huh. need God. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, do, you do need to propitiate those gods who might come and blow down your city with winds or floods, right? That was no. I, uh, don't have to rely on the same God who was providing you food, right. food, water for mm -hmm. your animals. Yeah, and and you're living if you are um, a, a you know settled agriculturalist, right, is much more secure than if you are a nomadic herdsman. But I mean, like if you're a farmer, that means that you can put back crops for a later time, and like right, it's easier to store food. Yeah, right. Like I mean, I, technically, I guess mm -hmm. you could with shepherds, but I don't. Well, you know, there's there's that whole, particularly, you know, sort of before the discovery even of, like, of salt as a preservative. Right. Um, problem with meat is it tends to go bad. Right. And, and it tends to go bad pretty fast. And the sheep, the sheep aren't going to live forever on their own. Like, it's not like something where, you know, you can just... Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, you know, sheep are easy to watch because they're dumb. But they're also dangerous to leave to their own devices yeah. because they're dumb. There's a, there's a great old Monty Python sketch 
Um, you know, there's a, a guy, um, he's watching these sheep in a field, and you know, he's, you know, why is that one sheep in a tree? Ah, well, he is that most dangerous of all things, a clever sheep. <laughs> he's got it into his head that he can teach the others to fly. <laughs> Yeah, don't trust a clever sheep. <laughs> even, a, even a clever sheep is not all that clever. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the, the, right, the point of tournament is that we actually see here a kind of opposite trajectory from a lot of what we see in other mythologies, right? If we look, for example, at Gilgamesh, right, the whole point is to get him around to embracing his role as king of the city, right? Embracing his role as leader of his people. Well, I was, um, was going to bring that up about still doesn't make any sense since like almost every every middle of nutrition I know about has always praised civilization. Civilization yeah. has always been the goal. Sure. Well you know there there is there is actually a similar strand because there's not there's mm -hmm. not really a lot of successful nomadic tribes. Right. At least not, not at least well they, they don't they don't succeed at building large scale societies because you can't. No, but the Mongols were pretty good. Well the the Mongols um, the Mongols were not I mean yeah they were nomadic herdsmen but they were—they also had like a great deal of sophisticated, um, like okay. social sophistication, and they also embraced the use of tools. Yeah, definitely. And technology. Yeah, Darlene. So I guess I'm still a little confused about mm -hmm. why. Like, I mean, I can understand why he would be cursed because you know he ate the tree, and that's why he got that and everything. Uh -huh. But at the very beginning of the chapter, mm -hmm. like the whole reason people were created was to till the soil. Well. Let's see, on the day the Lord God made earth and heavens, no shrub of the field being yet on the earth, and no plant of the field yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not caused rain to fall on the earth, and there was no human to till the soil. Now wetness would well from the earth to water all the surface of the soil. Then the Lord God fashioned the human hummus from the soil, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the human became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden to the east, and he placed there the human he had fashioned. So, is Adam, when he's initially created, actually supposed to till the soil. No. God's already done that, right? He's just supposed to tend the garden, right? He's like, I'm going to just put you here in the garden, and you look after it, and you take care of it, and you take what you want, except that. Don't take that thing. I mean, humans don't really have a point in the original one. When God mm -hmm. creates them, there's just a thing he created. Yeah, whereas, if, you know, if we look, for example, at the Enuma Elish, right? Human beings are created for a specific purpose there, right? They are created so the gods no longer have to work. Could this have been, could the Cain and Abel story have just been a completely different author altogether than the Yalvis? Um, usually not regarded as such. So it's, it's definitely the Yalvist. I mean, it's the Yalvist or the Elowist. I'm not entirely certain which one it is. Um, again, like I said, I'm deep enough into this stuff to know enough to teach a 2,000 level world literature course. Um, this is not my academic specialty. So let's just, let's, let's just you know, you know I've, I've read up on this, but you know, I haven't gone down all the dark arcane paths, right, that one could go down. Yes? I was just going to say, like you guys just said that humans weren't supposed to till the land, but it says, mm -hmm. and the Lord God took the human and set him down in the Garden of Eden to till mm -hmm. it and watch it. So that he's supposed to be tilling mm -hmm. it. Right, but the garden's already there, right? It's already producing. It's already giving him everything he needs. So any work he has to do there is basically minimal. Keep the weeds out. Yeah. So <clears throat> the point, the major difference is like he, he doesn't need any technology to do this, and it's not hard work yet, right? Okay. It's not hard work yet. The whole point like of farming as curse, right? Farming only becomes a curse once Adam, Adam and Eve know what good and evil are. And, okay, so that the human does not eat of the tree of life as well and become like a god to challenge us, then we have to send him out of here and do something to distract him. Right? Farming is that thing that has to be done to, right? Because farming is, you know, it's... Farming is hard work, right? I mean, how many of you have come from any kind of farming background? Right, my, okay, you do. That's one. My, gran, you know, my grandfather was a dairy farmer, right? You know, he worked, you know, he worked usually 12-hour days. 
Well, I mean, um, even back then, it was even more. There was a bigger contrast between like the two of them because farming takes so much longer since the soil the soil wasn't as productive, right? Yeah. Right. We, we with right without modern farming techniques, sure, the, the soil was was not as productive as it is. Uh, today, although it also probably eroded less slowly, or l l l probably eroded uh, less quickly than it does today. But, um, right, where was I going with that? Anywho, the final piece I want to sort of add to this, um, and I was actually, well, um, somebody said something about uh, the, this being contradictory to the usual trajectory that we see in creation myths, right, that civilization is usually regarded as the goal and the good thing. There is actually, if you look at certain Greek myths, there's this sense that we've sort of devolved from a golden age when the gods provided everything and fruit just fell off of trees um, and there was no violence and there were no tools and nobody had to work to a silver age where eh, things were maybe not quite as good, right? You had to work a little harder, um, but by and large, life was still pretty easy. To a Bronze Age, when people started making tools, and when they started tool making tools, they started making weapons, and this is when people first become violent. To an Iron Age, when pollution and violence are rampant, but we are also at our most technologically advanced. And most of those uh, Greek myths tell us that we are living in that Iron Age. Yeah, but there was a. Boy, I, was... I remember there being a reason why the other why the other uh, forms of humanity failed uh, in in the Greek stuff. I, like there was a reason why they went to the Golden Age and Silver Age. Oh sure. Age. Well, and, and it, it's actually it's suggest successive generations of gods overthrowing each other. And killing each other. I mean, if we look at like war wise, mm -hmm. um, one of the things in world history that I think was most interesting is the less technologically advanced the tools were, were they're were actually able to rule over larger amounts of area. Like, I mean, once we finally got to the Mongols, mm -hmm. they were you know, using what horses and um, Stuff like that, well, yeah, but they were also using very sophisticated siege equipment. Yeah. Um, and they had, yeah, recurve bows. They had very good swords. Right, but then after um, that, their military technology was very was very was very good anyway. But then after that, we go to like things like the Ottomans, right? And they didn't rule over nearly as much area. Like it's it, as technology gets more advanced, it seems like we become more. Well, as technology gets more advanced, you don't have the need for giant armies anymore. You can give. Five or six guys with mm -hmm. guns and hold off a bunch of dudes with short swords. Sure, if yeah, if you have more sophisticated weapons than your enemies do, or more sophisticated technology, right? You don't need as many horsemen um, with swords. But I just sort of want to point to one more, one more item here, where we look at the sort of the, the flood story, and then we'll sort of close with this because we are running out of time, right? <clears throat> Which line of descent, the line of descent of Cain, or not the line of, like Abel's line is a dead end, right? Abel's line ends with him. But he has another brother, Seth. Whose line of descent is it that causes God to bring on the flood? Um, was it Noah? Well, Noah is the guy he, that God tells about it, right? Whose descendants caused the flood? Cain's or Seth's? Whose descendants pissed God off enough to send the flood? Seth. Seth's. I would assume Cain. Yeah. Seth has issues with Cain. Yeah. It's the line of Cain that's the troublesome line. Right. Seth is the good guy. Right, and it happened as humankind began to. Well, I think that there's a chapter skipped here. As and it, and it happened as, pardon? Yeah, Seth is right is mentioned, but there is all the, also then still an intervening chapter that's missed. Right, and it happened as humankind began to multiply over the earth, and daughters were born to them. That the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were comely, and they took to them they took themselves wives howsoever they choose. And the Lord said, My breath shall not abide in the human forever, for he is but flesh. 
Let his days be 120 years. The Nephilim were then upon the earth, and afterward as well, the sons of God having come to bed with the daughters of man who bore them children. They are the heroes of yore, the men of renown. So we have here is a reference to demigods like we see in other traditions, right? These unions of divine and mortal. People like Gilgamesh, people like Achilles, right? Part man, part God. Wait, where, and what page is that? Page 163. And the Lord saw that the evil of the human creature was great on the earth, and that every scheme of his heart's devising was only perpetually evil. And the Lord regretted having made the human on earth and was grieved to the heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe out the human race I created from the face of the earth, from human to cattle to crawling thing to the fowl of the heavens, for I regret that I have made them. Now, last thing to point out, we, you know, we talked last time about how, yes, the, the Noah story is very similar to, uh, in many respects, the, um, the Utanapishtim flood myth, right? But the difference that we get here, right, is that a motive is provided here for destroying human beings, right? It's provided in dialogue, as most of the action is. But here, God is, given, is giving a reason for the destruction, right? There's no reason given in the Utanapishtim flood myth. None whatsoever. The other reason I wanted to just draw your attention briefly to the flood myth is that it's another one of these doublets. Right. This is another place where we can see the seams showing. Right. We have an account, I think, from the Yahwist and from the priestly writer, str uh, sort of strewn to get str uh, stranded together here. Um, we can see this in that we get two accounts of the length of the flood. Right. One account says 150 days, the other says 40 days and 40 nights. We also get different descriptions of the sets of animals that Noah is supposed to bring onto the ark, right? On the one hand, we say, uh, bring one pair of every kind of animal. And then what we assume comes from the priestly author, right? Bring seven pairs of clean animals and one pair each of unclean animals, right? Making that ritual distinction between the clean and the unclean that the Yahweh probably wouldn't have made. Okay, we are about out of time. Does anybody have any further questions or concerns before I let you go? Okay, so we're going to be looking at the Odyssey. Uh, next time we're going to be reading only books 6 through 8, right? So we're not reading the whole of the Odyssey. We're just reading a chunk in the middle. So you're going to be reading books 6 through 8. I have a couple of guide questions for you. And we'll see you all next Tuesday. Thank you.